Howdy, y'all. I am in uh, Eastern Washington here today, and uh, uh, my name is Shane Brody. I've been traveling around the country talking to fellow trans people about um, identity and politics and religion, beliefs of various sorts, uh, also uh, what's happening in, the, in their state or their, their locality, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm here with a guest, and she's going to introduce herself. Hi, my name's Talisha Sams. Um, I go by the she, her, and Ms. pronouns, and I live in Benton City. All right. I would have pronounced it Benton. <laughs> How is it pronounced for real? Bitten. It's B- all, instead bitten. of O-N, it's I-N, but that's how I do all of those. Bitten, okay. So um, a- as I was driving over to this area uh, last night, I encountered like some darkness in the sky, and then I started coughing a bit, and then I noticed that there were massive, there was massive clouds of smoke in the air. Um I guess this is good practice because I'm going to be traveling across Canada very soon. <laughs> um, and then I came to this area and I there's a, a large hill just right over there and the top of it is completely black. And then at the bottom there's some what looks like v- vineyards. Vineyards. And yeah. they are very green, very verdant. There's like a line. And then above that it's completely black. And I guess that's part of what the fire was, eh? Like yesterday? Yeah, it usually, part of it, if not all of it, once a year burns. Oh, really? And Is it a prescribed burn? No, okay. it just, it gets so dry around here that it just, something starts it. Yeah, it, it's super dry here. Oh but my it, goodness. it burned the whole hillside. It Sometimes it starts down the highway at Prosser, which is about 20 miles away, and it'll burn all day and slowly work its way up. But we had the wind blowing yesterday, so... That fanned it pretty good. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess there were multiple fires as well, not just one. It was it was many fires. Wow. Yeah, that was that frightening for you at all? Because, I mean, it's not that far. I mean, it's right there. It doesn't frighten me. I'm from Oregon, so we have forest fires down there all the okay. time. So what, what part of your Oregon are you from? Mountain Free Water. Oh, okay. So just, just right over there. Right. Across the border from across, Walla Walla and the uh, Blues. Right. Across the river, basically. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, with the river here, I'm, I'm never worried about coming over here. Okay. Uh, why is that? Well, it'll stop at the river. You got enough vegetation the, it, and stuff. That's such. true. That's true. There's a lot of irrigation out here, too, because there's a lot of um, agriculture, like really intense agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. They got a lot of vineyards. They keep putting them more in each year. I know. I know that's a thing right Uh, it's so interesting to me that I was thinking this as I was coming up here like it's really so there's Hanford which if you're familiar with eastern Washington you're going to be familiar with Hanford Um, it's a high level high level nuclear storage facility Uh, and then around it it looks like there's kind of this core of industry like heavy industry and then there's like it's a transportation hub as well Right. Yeah. There's a railroad. There's a large railroad yard, yard here or in Pasco. There's a, a regional airport. And then there's shipping. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it looks like the I mean, if you look at the map, the Columbia River is nice and wide. And then all of a sudden it, it gets a lot narrower. Yeah. And there's little islands that start. Yeah. You got several dams along there. Yeah. Um, Hydroelectric. And they yeah. go up the uh, Snake River with the barges mm-hmm. for the wheat during the summertime. Oh, okay. So, so. the Snake River is navigable. There. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking that, is it true that this area, it's kind of a bend here, and then the the uh, Columbia River, which is a massive river, goes starts going north. Um, is this the like, kind of the last point when those really big ships can come up the Columbia? Pretty much, yeah. Because um, I know the Columbia originally starts up in Canada and yeah. goes kind of zigzags down. Then from yeah. here it hits the gorge between Oregon and Washington, right? And then it goes all the way down. Um, yeah, the gorge. The, the reason why they call it a gorge because it's really deep, and then the, it's a really large river as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah and this is where they used to have the uh, Missoula Lake. Right. Oh yes. So right. all this was underwater at one yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. 
So during the last glaciation or, or so, it, what happened was there was an ice dam and then there was all this melt water and it formed a lake. And then that, that ice dam broke and all that water um, washed down onto the Columbia Plateau and carved basically huge potholes and, and scoured different things. And there was a geologist, Bretz, I believe his name was, who went around and he was like, hmm, I'm kind of seeing this, this stuff that looks like, you know, a river, but at a small, a very small scale, like all this flood damage. People didn't believe him for a long time. Yeah. And then they did aerial flights and stuff and they were like, oh, this guy was absolutely right, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, this whole part, like I said, was underwater mm, and yeah. a lot of the soil is make sure you find layers of sand, like uh-huh. a sandbar and then yes. regular soil. And a lot of the soil here, too, was blown in from, uh, like, when the eruptions happened, Mount St. Helens. That's and right. And also, I believe there's also loess, which is um, uh, wind-blown soil, like, from glaciation as yeah. well. Yeah. It doesn't stick together very well. No. No. It, it, so, you get a good gust of wind, and it, it flies around. Uh, they're actually, like, little triangles. So, yeah. yeah. They're very pokey. Um, so, did you grow up here? I grew up down in Oregon yeah, on a farm. Um, like I said, in the Blue Mountains, that's where our farm was. Okay. So I... Ended- I was just in that area, and it was so beautiful. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's ridiculous. So then between... Since Milton Free Water is pretty much right on the border between mm. Washington and Oregon, yeah. um, I grew up a lot in Walla Walla, too. Okay. And I actually came up here quite a bit, too. Mm-hmm. And then I went to high school down there, and then I went to college in Walla Walla, and then I came up here... The Washington State University. Okay. And went to school here, and then was that is that Pullman? Uh, well, they have their main campus in Pullman. Yeah. But they have a branch campus here in the okay. in the Tri Cities. Okay. So I went to that and got my four year degree, and then from there I moved up to Spokane. Okay. Went to law school. Okay. And, and Spokane is kind of like the big city in this area. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it's almost second or third between Seattle and Tacoma Mm -hmm. and you have Spokane but it's on the east side of the state yeah and when I it's grown a lot too. oh yeah oh my goodness and and I graduated in from law school in 2000 and then I stayed up there in my own practice and I was up there 11 years before I moved what kind of law did you do I've done every kind of law Uh, was it civil or criminal or both both okay I've been practicing 22 years now. Okay. So. Are you still a lawyer? I am. Okay. All right. Yeah. When when I was setting up, you mentioned something about um, like telework. Yeah. I currently I work down here with Adult Protective Services, which is oh. a state services DSHS. Okay. And during the pandemic, they allowed us to telework. So now that the pandemic's over and we can go in the office, law office still telework. Oh. So it can be a half and half. Um, so, but yeah. Okay. So, but in addition to uh, DSHS, I also have a private practice on the side. Okay. So I do guardianships for the elderly, uh, some family law, some criminal law. And then in between Spokane and here, I was actually a prosecutor for a few years. Okay. Well, so, that's quite diverse there. So I, I've been in federal court, state court. District court, municipal court, all mm. of them. Wow, to be such a, you know, have so many interests within law, you really have to study a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be flexible too. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Because, I mean, going from civil to criminal, that's like a whole different, that's yeah. that's a completely different set of giant books, you know. <laughs> different rules and, yeah. and, and situations. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and you're, you contacted me, and it seems like you've had um, multiple kind of, like, really important careers. You also, like, in the military, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I, like, 10 days after I graduated from high school, I went in the military for four years in the Army. Mm-hmm. And what, what kind of era was that? Excuse me? Time period? Um, from, like, 1980, 1984. Okay. So I was at Fort Lewis up near Tacoma first, mm. and then I was in Italy for a while. Okay. And then I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. But I was with, I was a paratrooper. I was with the 2nd of 75th Ranger Battalion in mm. Fort Lewis. Were you going for officer? No. No, okay, okay. No. 
But then uh, I went over, when I went over to Italy, I was with the 509th Airborne, which is part of the 82nd Airborne. Okay. I know nothing about this, but oh. I'm sure people who are watching do. But <laughs> Then from there, I went to Fort Bragg, which was, I think, well, the second of the 325, which is still part of the 82nd. That's their okay. main division right there. Okay. So, and then I was, um, well, a lot of people, even who know me personally, aren't aware when I was at Fort Bragg, um, I was actually one of the initial soldiers during the invasion of Grenada. In, oh my goodness! In 1983. Really? Wow. So. What was that like? Because that was kind of a, that was a little bit contentious. Like Reagan sending in troops to this little tiny island. Yeah, it was. It was personally, it's probably the worst kind of environment I wanted to go mm. to because I'm more of a mountain girl. Okay. And it's jungle there and humid mm. and. But, right, it's the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, that time period, we weren't too far out of, you know, leaving Vietnam. So the outlook on the military, what they could do or wanted to do Mm. or what they would commit to was, Mm. you know, pretty hesitant. So, yeah, it was just like we were the quick reactionary force. Yeah, it was really shocking, actually. I I mean, I was just a kid when this happened. But I remember thinking, wow, this is this seems really strange that we're sending troops in there. Like, it just seems strange. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to just just a little island. Um, it was a little shocking. That, like, I think I think that that Reagan did that. Um, anyway, how how long was your military career? Four years. Four years. Okay. So and I was I almost reenlisted for longer, but okay. um, I had to make a decisions at the end of the four year okay. between family and military. Okay. So, so you were considering a career, but then you decided not to. Yeah. Okay. All right. And at that point, did you decide to um, go to like? Um, college and law school and actually when I got out I still didn't know what I wanted to do with okay. my life yeah so, sure who does I don't know <laughs> a good I, a good friend I, I still don't know <laughs> a good friend of mine she talked me into going into the nursing program okay All so right. I went through the nursing program became yeah. a nurse okay and, and at that time that was unusual for um you know you, you, you used to present I, I'm assuming very differently. Yeah. At that time, you were, you probably looked more like a man. Presented yeah. as male. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the the instructors tried to talk me out of oh it. Oh my goodness, you're kidding me. You know. Oh my goodness. So they said, well, you know, most men uh, become respiratory therapists, not nurses. Okay. Which made me want to become a nurse even more. Yeah, sure. Why so I, not? So I completed nursing. <laughs> I love it that you're a little contrary there. You're like, no, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> well, well, even better is, is after I got done with nursing, then I went became a respiratory therapist. Okay. So just to show them, like, I can still do nursing. Sure. Well, it seems like you, um, you're you somebody who loves, to, loves a challenge, loves to, yeah. like, diversify and... Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, yeah, I, and I worked at the hospital down in Walla Walla for mm-hmm. a while. And then uh, at about seven years there, I decided to go to law school. Mm. So, um, I was just in, um, you know, smaller communities down in Oregon. And people there were saying that Walla Walla had pretty good um, medical care. Is there a, a big medical center there? Yeah, they actually have three hospitals down there. They have a veterans really? hospital, and they used to have general hospital, and then the bigger one was St. Mary's or Providence, as wow. they call it. That's amazing because Walla Walla is pretty small. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised at that. But St. Mary's kind of a few years back bought Walla Walla Hospital, okay. the regular one. It's kind of a battle between Walla Walla General was run by Adventists and providence by the catholics so there's always a battle there okay but yeah now it's, it's <laughs> a religious battle between yeah. hospitals what what how did that manifest what did that look like I, it's just if i don't know it was just it was kind of interesting walla walla general was a smaller hospital okay. but they have um in college place which is right next to walla walla they have the adventist college or whitman or not whitman oh, yeah. but walla walla college mm. so but yeah it's uh a trauma unit and such and uh it's about the only one in this area yeah yeah you know and if it's too serious for that they fly them up to spokane or up to seattle like a life flight yeah totally yeah i'm just really surprised because well i'm from a place um where there's hardly any medical care and there's like one big hospital in the region so i'm like wow this is really this is really great um 
So you worked as a nurse and as a respiratory therapist. Uh, what was that like? Did what did uh, what was it like being um, at the time a, a male presenting nurse? I guess. Um, I mean, there was some blowback. It wasn't so much from the regular staff. It was you know the higher up. That it was always considered a profession that just was for women. Mm. So, but there were some um, male nurses in there and such. Um, I primarily worked as a respiratory therapist, which I enjoyed. You traveled all around the hospital, you know, from working with babies to the emergency mm. room to intensive care. Mm. Um, but, you know, I guess the rebellious me, yeah. I just went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, how did your uh, patients react to you? As a male nurse? Most of them, I think they were very receptive. Mm. There's some procedures they didn't feel comfortable with. They okay. preferred a, a, what they considered female nurse and okay. such. Okay. Um, but most of the time, you know, especially you got a lot of the, the elderly men mm. that were, you know, they felt they could relate or something. I don't great. know. Great, great, great. Um, so speaking of kind of like a gender change, uh, when when did you first get inklings about that? Probably my whole life, a long okay. time ago. I've mm-hmm. always done things that, if you stereotype, they consider um, females would primarily do. Mm-hmm. Um, so the nursing, but what else? Because you were a paratrooper. I wouldn't say that that is usually something women get into. But. Well, once I started transitioning, I think this is about the best example. People were, were shocked. They said, I, I never saw this coming. They oh, said, okay. you were a paratrooper. You raced motorcycles. Mm. You went hunting. And I said, so does my daughter. Yeah, right. So, right. And they go, oh, well. And a, a lot of country women. I mean, go to Sturgis. There's uh, half the people there are women. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it. there's always been things like that I've, mm. I've you know, been towards even even in school mm. um i took shorthand okay and i remember the uh, and that's for like secretarial or yeah or court reporting and that sort of thing mm-hmm. and even the the teacher was shocked because i was presenting as male then mm-hmm. and i was the only one presenting as male in yeah. that mm-hmm. and uh yeah things used to be very like uh, this is a woman's skill and this is a man's skill. Yeah, uh, uh, pe- younger people who are watching this are probably like, what, you know? <laughs> yeah, so it's throughout my life there's been yeah. things like that I, I wanted to do. I just felt the desire to do. Mm. Uh, Did you want to go into like secretarial work or, or that sort of thing? Or, no, I no? looked at it more like a something that would be useful in okay. life. Yeah, you just know. a skill to pick up. Yeah, a skill. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I always wanted to learn shorthand just um, because I want to get, like, I when I was taking notes, I always wanted to get kind of more of the flavor of what the um, professor or teacher was saying. Because when they're talking so fast, it's hard to get it all down when you're you know writing yeah. longhand. I remember, too, uh, back in when I was in high school. I graduated mm. in 1980, but during that time, they had what they called home ec. Oh, yes. Which right. teach you how to... My mom was a home ec teacher, actually. Teach you how to cook and sew and stuff. Yes. And I still sew. I have several sewing machines. Oh, excellent. So, wow. And that was another one where people what, were shocked. What kind of stuff do you make, by the way? Or did you make back then? I made shirts. Mm. Um, well, even when I was in the military, I had my own sewing machine. would do sewing for the rest of the barracks. Cool. And made money on it. Cool. Um, but like now where I found it really comes in helpful is with my body changing, mm. clothes are always having to be adjusted and altered some. I, I hear you. And <laughs> there's no way you could afford to do that. Yeah. At a, you know, take it to seamstress or something like that. Yes. So, right. but I, I enjoy doing things like that. It's kind of a, a self sufficient. Yeah. Right. You know. It's, it's like, a, um, on my side of things too, there's uh, some trans men who learn how to hem pants and that sort of thing, or, or take in um, the sleeves on long long sleeve shirts, right? Yeah, yeah, similar. What I do now too is I'll go to the thrift shops and because mm. the clothes are so cheap, and I'll find something and I'm like, well, I'll experiment with that. Sure. If I mess up, it's not a lot of money out. Yeah, there you go. And and sometimes you can find some really good stuff. In, yeah. in thrift shop, in thrift shops, especially if you go to kind of a, 
you know, an area where there's a lot of retirees or something, you know, that's awesome because they, they often have nice, like nice clothes and, and they're giving them away and, you know, they get their fashion season, whatever clothes. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I used to live in Houston and it was a, a poor neighborhood on the edge of a, of a much more rich neighborhood. And so the rich ladies would drop off all the oh. expensive clothes. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can find clothes there. Sometimes they still have the price tags on. Oh my goodness! Someone had bought it, hung it up in their closet, and never bothered it. And then yeah, just, you yeah. Know. Back when I was a punk rocker, I had this one um, jacket, and it was like I don't know. Uh, there was like gold thread in it or something, and it was like a lapis. It was a lapis lazuli kind of blue. It was like a bright blue. It was from Neiman Marcus, oh. and I I found it at a thrift store. <laughs> <laughs> With my bad punk rock hair, I was wearing this like Neiman Marcus thing. Anyway, I got it at the five finger discount. <laughs> oh, yeah, you just, there's amazing what's in there, and of course, yeah. some of the things I look through, and I'm like, oh, that's something my mom would wear. Oh, uh, yes, right, you know. right. I remember there was uh, for a long time there was a lot of double knit, <laughs> double knit things. You know, yeah. like, oh, who wants to wear that? You know, poly, but, thick polyester. But I, I found it too is like a lot of them getting back to sewing. Yeah. I buy them and then I can change them because, yes. you know, even when I've transitioned, each year my body's changed proportion wise, okay. different things. Yeah, yeah. And how long has that been, by the way, a physical transition? Oh, I think it's been about seven years. Okay. I started when I was 54. Yeah. And I'm like 61 now. Right, right. So. And our bodies are just constantly changing too. Yeah. So you add like an extra layer of change with hormones. It's like a lot of change. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was, I was shocked how much it changed yeah. different areas and such. Like how, how did it change? The biggest surprise, I don't know if I want to say shock, it was a welcome surprise, was the amount of muscle decreased. Mm. I would say my... I've heard that a lot. My muscles probably decreased by about half. Mm. And I noticed my and coming from a background of being very active, yeah, a hunter and a paratrooper and stuff that was yeah. that must have been really noticeable. Yes, yeah. where where I first noticed it was my shoulders getting more narrow, mm. so the shirts I had would hang down more, and I'd okay. have to take them in. Sure, but I used to be a long distance runner. Okay, and so I had some, you know pretty toned legs. Mm-hmm. I remember looking back at my calves one time, and they. Or like half the size and it freaked me out oh wow i was like wow you know do i have a disease or something okay but then yeah. i realized i thought no it gets rid of the you know a lot of the, the male hormones which testosterone and so the muscle mass decreased that's right yeah so. and from my point of view from my experience of things i didn't quite have this but i did get bigger i did get more bulky not just fat because i am fat too but um I did definitely gain more muscle without even trying, like really not even trying. And I know guys who they just are suddenly very muscular after taking testosterone. Like they, some of them do work out. Some of them don't hardly work out and they're just like a wall of muscle. Yeah. It's amazing. But yeah, it's just, you know, everything, everything changing like that. And you know, I'm six one too. So yeah. I'm so tall and, and long arms, long legs, so a lot of things, a lot more noticeable. Mm, mm-hmm. Right. So, and then you you just, um, you hem or take out hems of clothing to make it um, fit better. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. yeah. I kind of gave up, even if I buy something new, I kind of gave up getting the perfect fit. So oh, okay. So, even if it's new, I'd make adjustments to it. Sure. To fit my body. Sure. Yeah, I want to learn how to sew too. But I've been saying this for years and years and years. (laughs) Something always gets in the way, you know. But yeah, I I learned it in high school and my mom, she's taught me along the way too on it. That's great. I used to actually sneak into my mom's sewing room sometimes and use, she had a faff. Uh Oh, yes. Very expensive. Uh, Because she was a, she was a science teacher as well as a home ec teacher. So she kind of did both. Yeah. But I really miss, I when I finally got to high school, they didn't have home ec. Oh. So it, I was in that kind of transition period there. And uh, I think it was a real loss because yeah. boys and girls learned a lot of different skills that they really needed for life, right? Yeah. Yeah, cooking and budgeting and all that stuff. 
Well, when I lived in Italy, too, I learned how to cook very okay. well. Italian okay. food, the real way. Oh, really? You know, not Olive Garden stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. But So I love to cook, Olive Garden is like McDonald's, but, you know, Italian yeah. flavor or something. But, yeah, I, you know, you... In fact, my kitchen's kind of Italian theme to okay. it, and yeah. I got a lot of Italian cookbooks. But yeah, always. I love. I I gotta say, I love your house. <clears throat> it is so comfortable. Like just being in here, I'm like, I feel like I'm soaking up local history or something. <laughs> like there's just so much going on here. Like um, some little antique kind of farmhouse kind of flavor, and then lots of um, stuff from Italy. It looks like and artwork as well as um, stuff from your family. It looks yeah. like you have, uh, you know, an extensive family. Yeah, and lots of big boxes of toys over here. Yeah. Very well-loved toys. Yeah. Yeah, my grandkids come here. My, my oh, granddaughter, I, she's like 14. I bet they love it. But I bet my, they love it. But my grandson, he just turned six. So okay. He loves to have a big house to run around. Oh, in. yeah. So many toys, too. It's well organized, though, I got to say. Oh, thank you. For, for kids, a lot of, you know, if you have a lot of kids coming over, it's pretty well organized. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, um, uh, what is your relationship to your family, you know, since uh, transitioning? <clears throat> sometimes that can be surprisingly good. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. It's surprisingly good. Okay, um, good. When... I first told my kids, I told my daughter, and we were up on the farm down in Oregon working out there, and then I just nonchalantly said, oh, I'm transgender, I identify as transgender. Her response was, she goes, oh, okay. We okay. continued on what we were doing, and my son was the same way. Um, not a problem. Okay. You know, they did still... They, did they kind of already know, or... Well, my son, he, he thought, oh, I thought you were just gay. And I go, okay. well, no, I was transgender. Mm. But I don't think they really suspected. Okay. Um, but even when they were growing up, raising them and such, it seemed like I would usually took the mother role okay. with them all the time. Okay. You know, mm. doing things that probably most dads wouldn't have done. Like what? Oh, just, you know, fixing their clothes, getting them meals, uh, just making sure everything was nice for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like kind of a full parenting experience, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, and, you know, when I told my mom, um, she didn't, it didn't raise an eyebrow. There's a mm. lot about it that she didn't know and still doesn't know. And okay. She, and she has questions, but she was fine with it. I mean, okay. we come from Scott-Irish descent, mm. so we're kind of like a clan down there. Okay. And so we stick together. And did you mention that you have a farm or there's a family yeah, farm? We have a family farm down there. What do you grow? Out? What do you grow? Um, it's mainly grazing for cattle. Okay. Um, we rent it out, but I also have some Scottish Highlander cows down there. Oh, those big fuzzy ones with the red. Fur. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Bubba. <laughs> it's because I got, it's because I got ex excited. <laughs> let, let, let me go calm him down a little bit. I got excited about the Scottish Highland cows, and my dog was like, "What?" <laughs> but yeah, we we my daughter she lives on the farm now. Yeah, and we have the Scottish Highlander cows, and we have goats. I love those. Oh, and you have goats right <clears throat> here. I do. <laughs> so and they're so calm too. I've been around goats before that are just jumping on everything and tr trying to destroy stuff, and these are really chilled out goats. Oh, when I go out there, they'll start screaming for me. Okay, all right. You know, wanting to get some grain or carrots or something like that, yeah, oranges. Yeah. But, yeah, I have chickens, too, and so is my daughter. Oh, and, oh you have to show me your chickens. Are, are they here, too? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I used to have chickens and ducks and geese when I lived in Alaska. Oh. I... You know, I could just sit outside and watch them all day. They're just so much fun. But yeah, we, you know, farm life, that's our whole family's like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's just the, it's mountain land and bottom land and there's a river that runs through it. Um, but we. Oh, you have a running river. Yeah. Oh, that. Oh. It's the one that eventually it, it goes, it's the North Fork. It goes in the Walla Walla River, which goes into the Columbia. Wow. Down here by Wallula. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing because I mean, it's so arid here to have land yeah. that has a surface 
surface water is that's pretty rare yeah so it's it's been in the family since like 1865 okay for a um, while mm-hmm. you know we had our ancestors came up on the wagon train okay and they homesteaded that area okay so the actual oregon trail yeah all right no dysentery <laughs> and uh but it was i traced i traced our family tree all the way back to the 1700s okay when we first came from you know europe okay and like uh, on the east coast and then you yeah came over? Uh-huh. i think it was like pennsylvania ohio then missouri and then came out here mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then melt free water west and pendleton area okay and there's a few kind of scattered up up here too but yeah it's so it's it's you know one way or another it's always been in the family mm-hmm. and so that's home yeah yeah i was making a little joke about the game the oregon trail do you know that game yeah because i every time i play it i die of dysentery in it oh <laughs> but yeah so there's a lot of history with the family yeah, yeah, down yeah. there and mm-hmm. such yeah wow that's great um I've noticed that there are lots of little towns kind of just dotting the landscape around here. And then when you go out from that, there's just farmland pretty much, or um, maybe what I would call, I don't, I'm pretty ignorant, but scrub or grassland or something like that. A lot of horses, uh, paints and Appaloosas is what I've heard. A lot of those. Um, Do you have any horses or have you? Not currently. We're trying to get some. I used oh. to have horses, so I have all the oh. saddles and tack and okay. all that. But uh, I know they're expensive to keep, but they're so sweet. Yeah, yeah. I love I that's I love farm animals. It's you know, being transgender, they're non judgmental. Right. They don't as long as they get fed, they're happy. Right. Right. So, but yeah. So that's what that's kind of my goal. We got the the cattle. We just got them last year. Mm. Um, but like you said, yeah, the big long hair and the oh, long horns on them. Yes, and, they're like a heritage breed. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. So, um, so in terms of your being trans, um, so there are these are very small towns out here. I mean, there's several of them kind of in this area, this bend in the river, this big bend in the river. Um, but I'm imagining that it's, um, you know, pretty conservative out here. Um, I, 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 I heard that Walla Walla is a little bit bluer, more democratic or something, uh, a little bit less conservative. But I'm imagining this area in particular is probably pretty conservative. Is that a, a good guess? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very Republican dominated yes. and conservative. Mm-hmm. And we've recently, for some reason this year, and I think it's just an overall nationwide uh, environment, is we've had a lot of pushback on the LGBTQ community. Right. Um, Have and, you felt that locally? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Like what kind of stuff? Well, they were going to have a story time drag show at one of the um, uh, establishments here in Richland. Oh, like a library? Or... Yeah. Okay. And they started getting protests, and they actually had a, a city councilman Mm. That kind of encouraged it by saying, if what? you have any complaints, notify the, the establishment that you have complaints. Okay. Well, then they had vandalism the night before. They had death threats that the FBI oh is investigating. Goodness. Wow. And we never used to have that much resistance, even though it's been a very conservative community. And you have a council person kind of egging that on. Yeah. That doesn't sound, that sounds like... Um, they're going be beyond the bounds of their job. Yeah, and that, yeah. that raised some controversy yeah. there, too. But, yeah, I, I even, in this community, I've ran for judge twice in the oh. past. And I was told ahead of time, and it pretty much came true. They said, you, you won't win because it's too conservative here. Yeah. I ran for a district court judge, and I think I got, it was against a setting judge, and I got 35% of the vote, which That's wasn't That's pretty bad. good. That's pretty good. But then I ran for Superior Court, and there was like six of us, and I finished last. Okay. Well, you know, I got to say, though, up in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is pretty conservative, that's where I live, we did have trans women on our city and borough councils before. So it is possible, even in conservative places. Yeah. I mean, if people think that you are, they know you because you grew up here, right? You have had businesses here. You've helped people with your uh, law practice. They obviously know that you're competent, right? 
So, um, I mean, 35%, that's pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing I would add, too, is that I transitioned about seven years ago. And a lot of the judges, the majority of the judges here um, and the attorneys knew me beforehand. Yeah. So they knew me afterwards. And they've been very receptive. Great. I've never had a problem with them. You know, I'm sure there's people that talk behind my back. But I don't hear it, so I don't care. But... (laughs) You yeah. know, they knew me before and they know me after. And, right. and you know, I know. You have other things you're doing. You know? Yeah. Screw them. <laughs> and, and I know some people try and be, I guess, when they transition more stealth. Mm. I gave up on that off the get go. Yeah. There's no way I was going to well, keep I, it a secret or also, anything. Also, I mean, if you were born, we're, you grew up pretty local and you know you've lived here for most of your life that's that would be very difficult to suddenly be stealth yeah yeah so. especially i mean you're very embedded in this community in yeah. many ways so yeah um I, I some people do like being stealth and often that requires moving somewhere else where they are more anonymous but when you do that also you um it used to actually be required of trans people that they had to break ties with their communities with their families, they had to get divorced, et cetera. Uh, luckily, that's not the standard of care, as they used to call yeah. it. Uh, so now people um, you know, are more close to their families, or they can negotiate that more, and they can stay married and that sort of thing. So that's, that's much more hopeful. It, it helps people's lives more. Yeah, my family, cousins and all that, have been so supportive. Oh, good, um, good. They didn't, they, like they said, you're the same person we grew yeah. up with. Your family. It's not a problem. Your family. You know, and we're pretty close knit yeah. and such. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the former in-laws. That was a different story. Okay. So I was I was married. Um, well, I've been divorced almost four years now. Okay. But it was after I transitioned that that became an issue with okay. my ex. Mm. The ironic thing about it was, we were married like seventeen years. Oh, wow. And she knew about this before we got married. Okay. It wasn't called transgender being transgender back then, but she knew. What kind of language did they use back then? Well, I think they they wanted to use transsexual. They transvestite mistakenly would come up a lot. Maybe cross-dresser. Cross-dresser. Yeah. And she was aware of all this and actually supported me in the home. Yeah. Um, but it was when I transitioned, went public, that oh, freaked her out. I see. Mm. And I remember her dad saying he wanted to kill me. <gasps> oh. And then, you know, you're no longer welcomed in, over at our place wow. and all that. And she made a decision to side with her family. No problem, Bubba. <laughs> so, so yeah, I just, but at that point I thought, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to yeah. do, you yeah. know, and I still, and you're, I mean, you're getting death threats from your father-in-law. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Ugh. So, but, you know, and then that was when my ex also became hostile towards okay. me. Okay. And well, I, it sounds like a good divorce then. Yeah. 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 So, but it, like I said, I have my family, my yeah. kids and stuff to rely back yeah. on. And, and stuff, so that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, your parents sound pretty cool. And Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my dad passed away a long time ago, like, 40 years ago okay. when I was, I think I just got out of the army. Okay. Um, but my mom, you know, she's always been there for me. That's great. And like I said, the, you know, she's turned 89 this year and there's a lot she doesn't understand. She mm-hmm. comes from the old school. Yeah, yeah. And, but she asks questions and such and, and I try and educate her and some of it's still confusing, but yeah. you know, that's her understanding of it because she still accepts me as her child. Yeah. And that's the important part. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't mind if people are ignorant at all. As long as they're kind, as long as they're coming from a um place of sincerity with questions, you know, etc. I I think if people are ignorant and they're willing to um you know, explore more and ask questions, I think that's really good. In fact, I appreciate people more if they don't know anything about trans mm-hmm. people. But they're still willing to stick it out and, and, and to love you and to figure it out. I, I actually appreciate that so much, you know. And she's my fashion critic, too. Oh, okay. 
when I try on different outfits, <laughs> oh, that's great. I'll, oh, I'll parade it. in front of her and I'll say, okay, mom, what do you think? And, <laughs> and she has positive things, but a lot of them too. Like if I'm going out, she'll say, that dress is too short and okay. too tight. And I'm like, <laughs> no bullshit from mom. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, or she'll say, where are you going to wear that? At? Well, that, that that's like classic mom. You're doing like the, the teenage going out to a dance kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> But, That's too tight. But she has, you know, she'll say, yeah, that top goes with that skirt or, yeah. you know, you might try this and or that looks nice. But she'll oh, she'll do great. that sometimes. That's, that skirt's too short or it's too tight. She wants my skirts below the knees. Okay. So I'm like. Well, it sounds like very playful too. That's great. So, but yeah. So. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um. So you're talking about like dressing up and going out. Do, are there events that you go out to, like maybe LGBT events or something like that? Yeah, um, I try and stay involved in that. A few years back, I was the co-chair for our local P flag. Oh, great! I love P flag. And when is they, your is your mom involved in that at all? No. Okay. No. Um, and then a lot of the local events, like in April, they had the red dress charity drag show. Okay. I don't so, know what red dress is. What is that? Everyone just wears red or okay. red dress. All right. And all the proceeds from um, the cover charge to, and they serve some food, all that goes towards local charities Great. for the LGBTQ Great. community. That's one thing that the LGBT community does is it, it tries to raise as much money, you know, in, internally for um, the causes that we, that we have that we need, like supporting elderly people, um, people with HIV, AIDS, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, that, that sort of fundraising happens a lot. It's, it's pretty constant. And then they have, in this area, they have what they call the climb, oh, which is people pay a fee and you, and they have like their booth set up and then Badger Mountain, which is one of the high hills behind us. Okay, they that's climb the one it. that burned. Yeah, <laughs> they climb to it. Okay. And uh, it's it's a charity event, but they have different okay. ones like that. Oh my goodness, that would be so hard to climb. I mean, that's a really quite a big mountain. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, people call these hills, but it's like, no, no. They're, they're mountains without trees. That's, that's right. What they There's, are. Yeah. They're, it, anywhere else, this would be called in a mountain, but this is like a, a grassy mountain rather than like a something with a peak with snow on it and, and yeah. trees. It's not like alpine, you know, yeah. but it's definitely a mountain. That's... I can imagine, though, like the really sporty people who would be running up it, though. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't <so>. be me. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I try and stay involved in uh, community events for the LGBTQ okay, community great. like that. Great. And being an attorney, if there's things I can help them with, you know, educate them on name changes exactly. and such. Yeah. In fact, Washington State has a new law that will go in effect next month, I think the 23rd on oh. name changes. Oh, great. Um, it used to be you had to file your name change in district court. Mm. And if you wanted to seal it, you had to go to superior court. And then they would only seal it for if there was domestic seal violence it. involved. Oh, my goodness. But the new law says you can file it in superior court and you can seal it based on gender identity. Sure, sure. Uh, which is good because when I did my name change, I did have someone who stalked me mm -hmm. through the records right. that way. Which the funny thing about it, if you can say that, is they thought they were going to blackmail me okay. because I was representing a uh, someone that was opposite of their friend. Okay. And they said, "Well, I know you're transgender." I said, <gasps> "Oh my goodness." I know I am. I'm out oh, about it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and but they did like a, a public records request sure. and all that, and and so it was hard for people. Don't like, you feel so ashamed? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just like, yeah, I have. You know, I'm part of the LGBTQ community, Woo! and it was it was funny to watch the wind escape their sails. Oh, yes, they thought great. they had me. I said, that's "No, great. I'm, I'm open about it." Yeah, yeah. But for some people who are more stealth or who are more private, um, having those records sealed is a good thing for them. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some places, I, I mean, it's different in all municipalities how you can change your records. Uh, that's why trans people sometimes have a mix of records, right? Some things have the appropriate information. Some pe some records have the old information, you know, or the new, you know. It, it's often a mix. I even have a mix. I have a mix of stuff uh, federally versus state versus, you know, um, other kinds of records. It's just how it is because different yeah. municipalities have different laws. Yeah, you know? I was able to change most everything into my new name. Yeah. Um, 
I think there's a few military records they still have to try and yeah. change. And then there's also stuff like the birth certificate. I mean, there's just multiple layers. I sort of cut through all of that early on and just got a um, passport. Oh. Yeah. And that was like, there you go. <laughs> that's that's kind of the final thing there. I still have to get mine. It's in, it was in the old name. It's since expired. But then we had a pandemic, so it right. expired during that. But yeah. But yeah, I've changed everything, birth certificate, mm-hmm. all that. I think yeah. it's just the military records. Yeah. Some some places even make you um, advertise it publicly, like oh, wow. in a newspaper that you are, like, you know, how there's um, businesses incorporate and they have to put their business name in the newspaper or something like that in the, in the classified section. Well, they would do that with trans people changing their names. Uh-huh. Um, you would have to uh, publicly say that this was your previous name and this is your new name in the newspaper. Uh, Not every place does that, thankfully. Um, But yeah, it it can be, um, violate your privacy. Yeah. Very, very fundamentally by doing that. One thing I did when I, this really applied for at work um, with the SHS was when I changed my name, the first and middle name is what I changed. Mm. The initials are still the same. Oh, great. Because on a great. lot of their records, they use the first two initials and the last oh, name. Oh, that's smart. So they don't have to change any of that's that. That's smart. Yeah. So. Some academics have problems with that because their old name is published in journals, right? Professional oh. journals, scientific journals. And you cannot change that because scientific or other kinds of research is then... Um, used in other publications so that name is just intricately you know connected to many publications so then when you change your name it can be very difficult yeah, yeah. and when i've applied for jobs and they ask for a transcript mm. so i always included the name change order sure. with it sure and but yeah um you, you know there's a lot of a lot of paperwork you have yeah. to do to change the name oh my goodness and Oh my goodness. You know, but. And then there's like bank stuff and everyday stuff. That's why it's so, um, it's really oppressive when they change the rules to make it more difficult for trans people. Yeah. Right. Because like if we go to the bank, like let's say that I had to have an ID that said female on it because I was born female and that was, that's what they put on my birth certificate. Right. Uh, they call that AFAB. So a assigned female at birth. So if Mm -hmm. I were to have an ID in it right now that said female and I went into the bank, what would they say to me? They'd probably go, oh, this is not you. You're trying to defraud us somehow, right? Well, one of the problems I had when I opened up a new bank account after I changed my name, Mm. they go by, they get your new name and then they run your uh, social security number. Sure. And it showed up as my own name. Yes. And so then the question was like, okay, you've had a different name before, mm. you know, and the bank's thinking, are you trying to pull yeah. something here, hide yeah. funds or something? Yeah, yeah. So I said, yes, I, I changed my name. And, you know, well, what was the reason? And they weren't trying to be, you know, prying into my personal business as, as much as because since 9-11 and a lot of that, they're very, in, you know, they find out a lot more about who's opening oh, an yes. account and all that. Yeah, yeah. So I finally said, I transitioned. Yeah. And she goes, oh, okay. Yeah. And that was it. I once had a, um, a speaking of 9-11, after that, the, uh, the federal government kept sending out letters, a lot of them to trans people, if their um, employment records uh, connected with social security numbers didn't match oh. their records, right? So in terms of gender marker or the, the name used or something. And it, I tell you, it's really frightening to get a letter from the federal government and have your HR department contact you uh-huh. and ask you all these questions that are really none of their business. Yeah. Really none of their business. But yeah, that was happening for a while. These are the, like those little things that happen. Like It's not little, but these are those things that happen all the time that we have to deal with as trans people. Yeah, there's there's a lot of those things. Yeah. I mean, people can say, well, you'll need to do this, need to do that, but there's still things that pop up. Yeah. I fall yeah. between the cracks that you weren't aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds you of know. stuff. 
I'm, I'm thankful though I was able to change things into my new name, like my retirement, social security mm. card, birth certificate, and all that. And like I said, yeah. it's just the military records and the school transcripts. Well, and military records can be a big deal. Like what if you have some sort of benefits that yeah. are connected to being in the military? Yeah. 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 Anyway, let's take a little break. How about that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we took a, a little break there, and I was looking around because there's just so much stuff in this house, and I just love it. It's so comfortable. I got to say that again. I think uh, eventually I want to make my own little nest because <laughs> I've been traveling a lot um, for most of my life, so it's really nice to come to a place like this and really feel how homey it is. Like I can tell this is such a well-lived-in house. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell there's been a lot of laughter here, a lot of fun, and you just have... Um, walls full of photographs of your family and artwork and that sort of thing and little kid artwork too I love that stuff mm -hmm. I love it I love it and then I noticed wow there's like this display of your medals oh. from when you're in the military and I, I thought that would be really good to show because it's pretty extensive there <laughs> yeah. yeah these are all my medals from when I was in the military yeah. you have uh, the 82nd Airborne 509th, which I was in Italy, the Ranger Battalion. Um, I have my, right up there, my Belgium jump wings. I went through Belgium jump school. Mm. And then down below, you have the Italian jump wings. I went through their school. And then, of course, you have, right there, you have all my medals um, that I got. And like I said, I was in combat, too, so you have... Uh, um, Expeditionary Force Medal and such, and then my, uh, let's see, Combat Infantry Badge. Great. But, wow. But yeah, different patches. You usually have a unit crest that went on the beret. Yeah. And then on your yeah, regular uniform. Yeah, I saw uniform. that photograph too of you in uniform. Yeah. So, Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Anyway, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to show that real quick. <clears throat> <clears throat> all right so we were kind of talking we were starting to talk a little bit about um laws like the the name change law that you were talking about um and kind of like these little hurdles all the time that trans people kind of have to go through there these legal hurdles and and how um you know the state unfortunately controls a lot of that with our lives and um so I was wondering if you could talk about like some of what's happening here in the Pacific North, Northwest, particularly in Washington, around new bills, new laws, that sort of thing. Okay, and like I've said, I've talked about the name change, but they yeah. also have mm -hmm. um, the adoption where same-sex couples or non-binary can um, adopt. Oh, they specifically included non-binary. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. They've changed the driver's license, so you don't have to put male or female. You can put X on there if you oh, want. Oh, great. Great. Um, they, I call, upgraded the discrimination laws to include uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. Mm. And that is at the state level? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They've also got rid of the gay panic defense, which someone was allowed to claim that if they found out you were gay and it basically made them panic, which is a bizarre, you know, defense to begin with. So they outlaw that. Yeah. And sometimes people will use that uh, defense in a murder case. Yeah. Like that it was okay somehow to murder somebody because you found out that they were trans or gay. So, yeah. so awful, so awful. They've passed a law on <clears throat> banning conversion therapy. Mm, good. Um, so it sounds like this state is being really proactive, like yeah. really getting out there and <clears throat> trying to protect people. Yeah. yeah. Our governor, Governor Inslee, I think he's ran a couple terms. He's not going to run again, but he's mm. been very favorable and, and protective of Great. the LGBTQ community. Great. I bet that took a lot of uh, activism as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing you find with Washington State is two-thirds of it is east of the Cascades is very rural and conservative. Mm -hmm. The other part around the Seattle, Olympia, Lacey area uh, is more, you know, progressive. Yes. So. 
and that's where the majority of the people live. Yeah, is in Western Washington. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah, it's you know, so it's kind of hard to balance the whole state. But he does it, and you get, you see the the pushback, especially this side mm. um, area. But and uh, when we took a little break, you mentioned that there was something about Washington being a sanctuary of a sort. Yeah, because um, we because uh, this state has more hostile neighbors. Let's say like. I'm going to just say it, Idaho. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's even a a local secessionist movement here in eastern Washington and eastern Oregon that want to vote to, they just voted on it, to join Idaho. But that's impossible because it takes federal federal, uh, rules to do that. But. Yeah, it would be frightening if that yeah. happened. It's, but. A, it's, it's, it's a performance. Y'all are being performative. But yeah, the <laughs> sanctuary state for like the hostile states like Idaho and some yeah. of the others. So it prevents those other states from obtaining information about LGBTQ yeah. individuals. Yeah. Um, well, they want to criminalize people for going across the border and getting health care, yeah. for instance. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of interesting. They what, wonder, what country do we live in now? I, I think we're yeah. in the United States. Is that what the United States is going to do now? So they wanted to control their own state citizens. And when right. they said, well, let's go elsewhere. Well, we're going to try and control that, too. Oh, my it's goodness. Like, yeah. Wow. But um, one of the other issues I've, as an older person who's transitioned, is, you know, trying to find the health care. Mm. Even in Washington State, that can be difficult. Right. And um, we were just mentioning how Walla Walla has pretty good health care. But still, even with that, yeah. it's still difficult. Okay. Like with me, originally I had a primary care physician here mm. and an endocrinologist. And now I have to go to Spokane, which oh. is two and a half hours away. Yeah, that's a ways. And even that's getting more difficult. Okay. And even my... Why would it... Why would it get more difficult if, if there are good state laws here? They have difficulty finding doctors with gender care experience. Okay. And the ones that say they do have it really don't have it. Okay. So it sounds like there needs to be some training, either Definitely. in medical school that needs to um, be more extensive, or also doctors and other, other healthcare professionals they continue with their education throughout their careers. So there's no excuse to not continue to do that if there's a need for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not the only one that runs into this problem. A lot of the the younger um, individuals do too. But I was told just recently, they say, well, if we can't find some of those regular gender care, you may have to just go up to Seattle. Oh, my goodness. Which is like a four-hour drive away. And it's just so it gets kind of... Mountain ranges <laughs> yeah. on the other side of the state. <laughs> so it, it gets, you know, a little difficult yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. And that's just not a, a road trip. That's like you have to spend money on hotels. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, yeah. Four hours up, four hours back, that's a whole day in, its, yeah. in itself. And plus, most of your appointments are early in the morning, so yeah. you have to spend the night up there. Right. Um, and when they, when they, when this happens, when there's kind of this concentrating of care in one particular place, guess what? There's not a lot of appointments, right? Because there's, a, there's the same amount of people, or even more people, because our population is going up, you know, just in general, mm-hmm. everybody, you know. Um, and there's less and less resources, and they're concentrated in fewer and fewer places. It's just harder and harder to get actual care. Well, I like with my surgery, I had my surgeries top and bottom the last couple of years. Mm. The first surgery, you have to go through the process and you have to have a consultation, and you have to get the letters from your right. doctor or your It's multiple counselor. steps. Yeah. And then they have to do the pre-op and then they schedule the surgery and sometimes you were talking not quite a year I think on mine from beginning to go for each now they're looking two years out for surgery oh my goodness and that's just a waiting period yeah oh my goodness and um, but I was very fortunate we have in this area in Spokane um, Dr. Stiller who does all that care Dr. Stiller okay and he was originally had his practice in like the Pullman area Mm. and and he still does some surgery down in Colfax, which is on the Washington side. Okay. And uh, but he does most of them in Spokane. So 
you know, he's in quite demand. Okay. But he's mm-hmm. a very good surgeon, very thorough on everything, very knowledgeable yeah. on everything. Yeah. But other than that, you know, I've seen some of the Facebook groups I'm in on transgender care, and some of these people have trouble finding someone in Seattle. Yeah, right. So, And also, if let's say that you don't like a particular doctor, like if you're somebody who actually just doesn't like Dr. Stiller or what he does or his personality or whatever. I mean, there's so many things, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I, I have to form a... a at least a little bit of a relationship there that I trust them with my body. Right. (laughs) Um, So if you're somebody who maybe doesn't like the local doctor, you know, what do you do? I mean, that's so difficult, right? You have to go very far afield. If there's only one, one. Yeah. When I first started transitioning and I looked into the surgery through my insurance, the closest place was like in Arizona. Oh my, what? That's on the other side of the country. And then you had to pay for your own transportation, your flight, your hotel, and all that. Right. Um, But then that changed. And And it's not like you can just jump on a plane then. Yeah. Right? You have to stay somewhere for a while and heal up. But they're they're improving the insurance company. In fact, I'm on one of the the insurance I have. I'm on their board, their panel, advisory Mm. for gender care. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, offer suggestions. Um, Oh, you're on the panel that... That for the insurance company. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's such good activism. Thank you for doing so, that. I've been doing that probably two years now, and I'm on for another two-year term. Oh, thank you so but, much. But yeah, we, we have our meetings to discuss, okay, what kind of the standard care, what can we do to improve yeah. this, make it more accessible, and yeah. so forth. And they're very receptive. Yeah. The doctors on the board, too, are very receptive, and yeah. they take positive steps to make that happen. Yeah. I, you know, I, and I got to say, too, uh, I'm glad that you're so proactive as a board person, because I know people who are on boards who just sit there, and they don't really do stuff to improve um, a situation. So if you're on a board or if you're thinking about getting on a board, this is really good activism, um, that you're doing. So take, take heed right here. Take, take some notes because you can actually affect change. If you're kind of a privileged person, like you're somewhat privileged, right? You're a lawyer, you're, you know, um, very stable, you know, economically, etc. And so you're on a board. So if you're a person like that, who can get on a board and you have good politics where you want to help people take that to the boardroom, take it to the boardroom, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's, I, it's I always, always try and be proactive that yeah. way. I just, I look at, you know, with my profession being an attorney, like you said, yeah. it gives me some advantage and right. the medical background. That's right. You have some access that other people don't, don't have. And I, and realizing other people don't have that access, I feel it's almost my duty that's right to go you know the extra mile for them that's right and that's, that's what right. I enjoy doing I enjoy helping people that's wonderful that's wonderful um, speaking of that um, how are you in community here uh, do you have um, peer support do you have other trans friends uh, here in the in in this area yeah we a lot of them we connect through the Facebook they have a special group for mm. just a Tri Cities, they call sure. it Tri Cities, uh, LGBTQ community. Yeah. Tri Cities is, is several little cities out here. Yeah. yeah. They call it, people say, oh, so there's three cities. Well, no, no there's actually like four or five. <laughs> yeah, there's but, a bunch of them, the little ones. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, we connect through there. They, the way I got connected to begin with was when I started going to the P Flag mm-hmm. support group. Yeah. And then I became a um, co chair person for that. Um, so we, we talk, <laughs> you that start way. going and then you're co-chair of it. Yeah, <laughs> I but, see. I see. <laughs> but it, it was, it was one of those where they almost, they didn't have anyone to fill those spots and it was going to go away. I thought, you're no, going to jump in there. We have to keep it there. I love it. I love so, it. But yeah, we, I'm like that too. I'm like, Oh, nobody's doing this. Let me get in there. <laughs> I, I found Facebook is a good medium to be connected in a community. Yeah. Yeah, it's especially good uh, among older people. Some of the younger people aren't really using Facebook anymore. They're kind of off on Discord and other other sorts of platforms. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty useful. You know, events coming up, um, everything. You know, from skate night to just support meetings. Oh, you have skate night. Yeah, like an eighties style, like disco skate night. Oh, I love it. I love it. But yeah, there's you know lots of support that way. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, is uh, because this is like we were saying, it's it's a rather conservative area. It's 
out here, not quite the boonies, not quite the sticks, but it, it's off the uh, beaten path for, yeah. for a lot of trans people. In fact, this is probably a place where um, if people figure out that they're trans or, or queer, they would move away from into a bigger city like Seattle or, or Portland or even yeah. Boise. Um, so I guess I'm wondering um, how is it different being community here? And do you have to maybe rely on each other a little bit more? Do you I, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think yeah. I think you do. When I first started transitioning or looking into this, I thought there's no one down here to connect mm. to. But it's it's all under the surface. Sure. And once you start digging, then you know this person who knows that person, mm -hmm. and you start seeing the different groups and you know activities. So. It's there. You just yeah. have to start kind of scraping away. Yeah. But like I said, it's more word of mouth. Yeah. You have to gain some trust, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, you just kind of dig on the surface and you find them, and it opens up a whole new world. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. So, Great. But <sighs> have you have you uh, organized any local events yourself? Uh, I haven't. Yeah. Okay. Um, Not yet. I would say the LGBTQ community here is usually kind of the younger ones that kind of push that, okay. and then I'll say, "Oh yeah, well we can do this too." Okay. Or you know maybe <laughs> they they run into a mutual problem legal wise, and okay. I'll say, "Oh well, the law is just as you know, okay. or these are the resources you can contact." Okay. You know, and I would say that. You so know, the younger person, uh, the younger people, maybe more the firebrands, and yeah. and you're the one with the knowledge or the resources to back that yeah. up. That's great. And I think sometimes them knowing I'm an attorney, they they look forward to, you know, as inspiration to me. Mm. Sometimes, like recently for Pride Month, I decorated my cubicle at work with solid Pride flags. Okay. And just a wall of. Pride oh yeah, okay, I had the, the big transgender flag, then the regular flag, and then the mini ones on streamers, mm -hmm. and then the ones on little poles, and people, I got so many good comments, I posted online to one of the local groups, yeah. and they were so inspired by that, Great, because they run into situation, I had people comment that where they work at, they're not allowed to go, mm. that way they can have maybe one little flag, mm. and you know, but I think being an attorney too, I know the laws inside and out. Yeah, right. You know, what employers can do and what they can't do. So I think they're a little more reluctant to say, oh, you can't do that when they know I can because yeah. I know the law. Right, you know the law. So, but <laughs> try me. <laughs> I, I, I try and be inspiration to others like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, sometimes I take it on the chin, but I figure if it makes... What do you mean you take it on the chin? Uh, even as an attorney, I still get harassed. I oh. still get discriminated against. Okay, really? Um, I can't go in detail, but there are some active cases I'm involved in in the courts. Oh, really? Okay. And where I just said, no, this isn't right. Okay. And I kind of look at it, and I've had people say, yeah, that's right, where I say, I'm an attorney and they do this. Just imagine what they do to the people who aren't attorneys. Right. And they right. said, yeah. Or people who are younger or poorer or of yeah. a different ethnic background. Yeah, totally. Totally. So, mm -hmm. and, and I'm still shocked when I see some of the local community too, even statewide, um, how employers discriminate against mm. them. I'm like, no, they can't Here do that. Here in Washington. Wow. Mm. They, they still do it. I think that shocks me with all the laws yeah. that you have and it still happens. And like yeah. I said, it even happened to me. Yeah. Well, it is hard to prove. It, it, yeah. It's very difficult to prove. Yeah. Especially if people are very underhanded or passive aggressive or they do things in secret. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, good on you for, for fighting back with the skills that you have there. That's great. Well, thank you. Yeah. And this community sounds really wonderful. I mean, lots of little parties and get togethers and some political action. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, is there, um, like, are there any public events here? Like uh, pride um, marches, that kind of thing? Yeah. They, um, well, like I mentioned before, they had one of the local establishments had the drag show reading mm -hmm. they were going to do for kids. And like I said, they got back blowback from that from some of the local people, but they went ahead with it anyway. Yeah, go uh, do it anyway. They have, yeah. they have the it. pride each year. They didn't think they were going to have it this year because they were reorganizing the whole 
pride unit here. Okay. But was it canceled a while, for a while because of COVID? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I they, noticed that there's some reorganization after COVID. Like people are kind of rearranging kind of public events and how they do stuff. But they're go- they are going to have, they didn't think they'd have a pride this year because of that. But okay. they are having it. I think it's uh, July. Okay, first, great. It's like the second week or first week of July. Okay, great. So, but yeah, they have a little march and then they have all their booths and such. Yeah. So my, I've always taken like, what was it? I think they had one last year it was the first year after the pandemic and I took my granddaughter. She mm, wanted to go. Great. So she enjoys that stuff. So we went. Awesome. So awesome. Yeah. That's really nice and colorful for kids, you know? Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm from a, you know, Fairbanks is kind of a small community. There's only 40,000 in the city and then 80,000 in the borough, which is really large. And, uh, we have some, um, events that are um, public and they're LGBT oriented. And it's so nice to go to them uh, because oftentimes people are kind of isolated in their lives. Uh, but when there's a big event, you know, pe- people kind of come out to it, you know, to they make sure that they show up. And it's so nice because maybe you haven't seen it, somebody in a while, in a, yeah. in a few months or a year or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, one of our local um establishments out and about they are really supportive and they initiate mm. a lot of this and they help great. fill in the blank spots great you know with their they advertise as the uh longest drag show in washington state awesome so even when when i was down in oregon i'd come up i knew about them yeah and so they you know with the pride thing they put on their little show on the stage and all that mm-hmm. and such and they're very supportive yeah that's cool all right. Um, any last uh, thoughts you have, like for other uh, trans people who are living in more rural places, more red places, or maybe for older trans women? I think my advice would be, you know, find support groups. There's people mm. out there, and that's very helpful. Yeah. Counseling is helpful. That's one of the things is part of my insurance requirement. You have to see a counselor mm. and they're very supportive. It sounds like too, you hooked up with a good group, which was PFLAG, right? Yeah. They gave you a lot of resources and PFLAG is national. So if you contact any PFLAG, they're going to be able to hook you up with whatever uh, group is close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And individually, you know, be yourself. It, it's hard. It's discouraging, but you're not only doing it for you, you're doing it for a lot of other people. That's true. And That's I've true. always practiced my life. It's like I do this. It's not necessarily for me. It's for the other people aren't able to. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, get your support group. If your family's rejecting you, there's people out there that still care for you. Mm-hmm. You know. And you're living that life as well. Yeah. There's obviously so many people that care about you. You know, I mean, look at this house full of full of love and and drawings and stuff from your grandchildren. It's so great. I would add that at work, they were very supportive. Most of them. That's There's wonderful. a few, but okay, yeah. most of them were very supportive. Great, great. They even still give me tips. Like, <laughs> no, those shoes don't go with that dress. Okay. You wear sandals, not heels. And, you know, <laughs> sure. Something like that. Well, I, I just, I'm so tickled that your mom, you do that with your mom too. <laughs> But, you know, I I know some people, I would add, this is one thing I've mentioned to people, is when someone's transitioning, one of the first, and I did this too, one of the first things that enters their mind is they want to pass. They want that term. I want to pass as a woman. Mm -hmm. My advice is quit thinking that. Yeah. Um, I recently, what was it, last month did a presentation in front of uh, all the judges for Superior Court Judges for Washington State. Uh, their conference they have each year. They were up in. Sp- <laughs> this is a whole nother thing. Why? Why were you doing that? <laughs> they once a year they have their conference. Yeah. They discuss different issues. So I was asked by a, a judge who was my mentor. Yeah. In King County in Seattle, if I wanted to be part of the panel for wow. uh, diversity in the courtroom. Oh my goodness! Concerning pronouns. So you are directly influencing judges here. Like educating them. Yeah. Wow, that's so awesome. We did that, and it was an hour and a half presentation. But mm. one of the things that where I told them was, I said, I don't care who knows I'm transgender. When I get in the courtroom, I'm there to argue my case. Yeah. 
Right. People look at me and say, she's a very tall woman, or she used to be a man, as they like to say, Mm. or, you know, I'm not sure, or they say, that person's transgender. I don't care. Yeah. You're there to be a lawyer. I heard (laughs) heard a, a quote one time where the person says, this is who I am. This is how a transgender woman looks you know, get over it. Mm-hmm. And that's how I do it. And, yeah. you know, if I'm in a store and someone says, you know, you're not fooling anyone. Oh, you know, my response is, you can see me. <laughs> and then they're like confused, that's, but that's so cowardly though. Like mind your own business, you know, but, and I'm a little short guy who, you know, who's fat and who has a higher voice, you know, but, mind your own damn business. But my view is like, yeah, I'm not fooling anyone. This is who I am. I'm open about right, it. Right, right. If someone says, are you transgender? Yeah, fine. And my voice coming in low, it's like, at first I was self-conscious. Now I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is how I am. This is your life. Yeah. But yeah, just just be yourself and, and don't give up and find someone that can give you support. Maybe someone's mm-hmm. been through it and mm-hmm. so you're not reinventing the wheel. That's right. That's right. And you are who you are. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I just love it. Thank you so much for having me in your home. It's so wonderful to meet, um, I got to say, older trans people as well. You know, we've all been through a lot, you know, Um, and obviously you've you've done a lot. You've had several careers here and you were in the military and you got lots of honors. And yeah, awesome. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you. It's nice meeting you. you. All right. And I'm going to go say hi to your goats now and your chickens. Okay. (laughs) I'm so happy about that. All right. (laughs) All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.